Retreat to the City Limits January 26, 24, 1943 Jean Lebris, 22 Marek's task was to establish immediate communication with us as soon as we arrived at our new positions. I and my comrades headed back, tormented by many troubled thoughts. I cared little for the few weapons and ammunition we had left. The only thing on my mind was, how would we physically be able to carry it all? Our stomachs were empty, and the biting cold was constantly chilling us to the bone at even the slightest breeze. It was already dark when Lieutenant Augst and Field Feeble Kupal, the platoon commanders, came to see me. I told them about the situation. Gentlemen, the situation is lousy. The resistance of our comrades on the southern and western fronts of the cauldron has been broken. Units are being pulled back into the city in hasty groups. Now there are northern and southern cauldrons in the city. Tonight our division is going to retreat behind Gorodishche to the western edge of the city. We are to operate in the rear guard, and then early in the morning in two stages to withdraw to our assigned positions. Hauptmann Kraus showed me these positions on the map. Look here, on my map. They are here, where the Mokraya Machetka River flows into the Orlovka River. The front line here is almost at right angles and runs first from west to east and then from north to south. Thus, we are to withdraw in an easterly direction to the northwestern outskirts of the city. Do we have any comrades who can no longer move unaided? No? Good. And encourage the men so we don't have any stragglers. The soldiers will march in pairs, as we did the last time. Whoever falls behind, we won't pick him up and he'll freeze to death. The head of the column will move at a pace that everyone can manage. Herr Augst, you will stay at the rear of the column. I'll go ahead and make sure we don't go off the road. Any questions? Oh yes, the withdrawal will begin at 0600 hours, so that before dawn we can cover a sufficient distance to prevent the enemy from following us. So see you tomorrow. Jansund, 23. At last the night passed. At six o'clock the soldiers set out. They presented a spectacle that would have caused laughter if the situation had not been so serious. Barely recognisable figures huddled in the remnants of their uniforms, which gave the bare minimum of protection from the cold. My soldiers had the only machine gun left, which had formerly been in service with the heavy machine gun company of our former battalion. The machine gun's machine tool was damaged, and we left it in its old position. The second machine gun was damaged by shrapnel. Our arsenal consisted of rifles, several PEO-8 Parabellum pistols and some ammunition. In addition, we still had 10-12 pieces of hand grenades. Eggs. Slowly, so that everyone could keep up, I and the company's control section were figuring out the best route to take. It was easy to make a serious mistake when the whole surrounding landscape was covered with deep snow. We didn't make any rest stops until I concluded that the enemy could no longer observe us. It was still calm, thank God. It was some time, however, until Lieutenant Augst came up with the stragglers. It was difficult to recognise our own comrades. We had to get up close and exchange a few phrases to make sure we were talking to them. Helmets and helmets were pulled so deep over the head that only the eyes were visible. As these brave executive soldiers stretched indifferently in the snow, recovering their breath, I said a few words to them. I told them that we would stop more often, but only for a short time, so that the sweat of the body would not have time to freeze. And so we wandered further east into the city, a rearguard that could be called anything but that. Nevertheless, we had accomplished our task. We reached the heights when it was already getting dusk. From about eight kilometres to the outskirts of the city, we managed to walk about four kilometres in a straight line. We were all completely exhausted. Three old shelters were discovered in the hillside. It must have once been occupied by a rear unit or communications personnel. We didn't know that. The shelters were covered with snow and a layer of ice on the inside. I decided that this is where we would spend the night, some of the soldiers were ready to literally collapse from fatigue. I assigned two soldiers to guard. The sentries were arranged in four half-shifts. They were to go from dugout to dugout. 
Augst, Kupal and I also divided the night among ourselves into shifts. Everyone huddled together like sardines in a jar and warmed each other with the little warmth our bodies provided. Soon the fresh snow covered our tracks and I let the sentries take cover. More than anyone else, I realised that all our destinies were in God's hands. I was ready to accept patiently what was in store for me. Jan. 24. It was light outside. Someone at the entrance had pulled back the tarpaulin that provided some protection from the cold outside. It was snowing. Overnight we had been snowed in enough. Today, January 24th, the sky was clear and cloudless again. We dug ourselves out of the snowdrift and began to keep eastward again. The deep snow made it very difficult for us to go forward. There was not a soul anywhere as far as the eye could see. Today we were supposed to reach the town. We all had to endure a night that seemed endless. The deep snow had protected our shelters from the frost. But now, with the clear weather, we felt it again in all its severity. We could not move as straight as we would have liked. The many funnels filled with snow made us constantly veer off to the side, which made the path very difficult. If my watch showed the correct time, it was just past noon. On a level ground that appeared in the snow, as if by order, we stopped again for a rest. We endeavoured to keep somewhat apart one from the other, so as not to form a crowded group. Suddenly Pavelek, who possessed the vision of a kite, pointed in the direction of the still invisible town and exclaimed, Herr Hauptmann, look over there, there's a huge flock of crows, and where crows fight, there must be something edible. He was right. Crows were squabbling 300-400 metres away from use. They soared into the air and dive again at some dark object. I could see it clearly through my binoculars, but I could not distinguish what it was. Jushko, go over there. Take Nemets with you. Let's see if your assumption holds up. They both waded through the snow. The hope of finding something edible drove them forward. They both came back after about half an hour. The walk was worth it. They found a ruined container, one of the ones we had been dropped from the air with more than 30 loaves of bread in it. Some of the loaves had been pecked by crows, but we were not angry with them for that, for otherwise nothing would have attracted Pavelek's attention. I thought of the other comrades in Krause's group, and then of the order from the army command that the dumped containers were to be given away. I kept ten loaves and divided them among the soldiers. The rest were collected by Dittner and two soldiers. They were to take them to the Kraus Group's CP and then stay there and wait for our arrival at the new positions. After that, Marek would bring them to us. The bread was so frozen that even the most thoughtless could not bite into it. We put pieces of bread in our pants to thaw and warm it there. The last loaf was just being cut to pieces with a bayonet when a scream was heard. Russians from the front! I looked through my binoculars and decided that I must be dreaming. About 1,000 metres ahead, a black living wall was moving towards us. I looked there again to make sure I wasn't crazy. No, that's right. In a strip of a good 100 metres, several rows of Russians were advancing with bound hands, one after another, and straight in our direction. They were followed by several figures scattered across the whole width of this long line, those kept at a distance of about 30 or 40 metres one from the other and clutched automatic rifles in their hands. Together they were at least 400 men, but it could have been 600 or even 800. I had no idea exactly. Were they convicted or released Russian prisoners? Whatever the case, this wall of people was moving and they were all heading straight toward us. My soldiers took cover in the snowdrifts and stared at what seemed to all of us to be a figment of imagination. What was I supposed to do? All our armament consisted of one machine gun. Other than that, we had nothing but carbines, a few assault rifles, and the rest of our personal weapons designed for close combat. In addition, there were Oro 8 pistols and a few hand grenades, which we called balls. Imagine what would have happened if we had even one of those legendary MG42s about which we have heard so many amazing things. Then everything would be clear, let them get within 200 metres, and then fire with self-selecting targets. 
Nevertheless, I decided to open fire as early as possible. When we opened fire, there was still about 800 metres between us and this wall of people. I had no more than 150 men with me, and we all fired indiscriminately. Most of my subordinates could not twitch the bolts of their rifles, which were frozen. The machine gun kept giving delays, one after another. He was as stubborn as a donkey. Wanting to set an example for my subordinates, I grabbed a carbine too, and I couldn't pull the bolt either. Everything seemed to be working against us. Here we are at last. The machine gun spit out a sheaf of fire. Br -br 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 -br. Only fifteen to twenty shots, then refused to fire again. Nevertheless, it worked, because the living wall was no longer standing, but lay fallow. We were still separated by about six hundred metres. A few shots from our side showed that this state of affairs would remain unchanged for several hours more. I sent Nemetz to the rear, ordering him to run like a greyhound. He was to sniff out where the nearest headquarters was and tell everything there. And he was lucky. After quite a long time, a shell of a Nebelwerfer, six-barrel rocket mortar, fell near the Russians. The shot was unaimed and did not harm the enemy. But as it was still light, the Russians did not move. My comrades were completely exhausted. From time to time I approached one or the other group of soldiers and urged them to watch for signs of frostbite in each other. I was able to move about unhindered because for some reason not a single shot had yet been fired by the Russians. Some of our comrades lay down beside us on the ground and got ready to sleep. They had had too many trials. I, too, struggled to fight the irresistible urge to sleep. You boys hold out a little longer, until dark. Then we'll move on to new positions and you can get some sleep. I shook one of the ones that had fallen to the ground. He fell and never moved again. My comrades looked at me in silence. Some no longer understood what I was saying. Some had white spots clearly visible on their faces. When they noticed it, they took a handful of snow and rubbed it on the spot. Finally, it got dark. I gave the order to move on. Someone's figure was being pushed aside. The soldier could only mumble, Leave me alone. Let me sleep. For God's sake, you'll freeze and I can't carry you. Pull yourself together. I'm tired. Let me sleep. We moved forward. Two sons of our country were left lying on the sidelines. They did their duty to the end, and in the end the cold took their lives. When I thought about those deaths, I realised that freezing to death was a merciful death. You get so tired that all you want is to sleep, to plunge into an eternal dream where everything is equally good for everyone. We walked through the snow for the last hundred metres until we reached the Orlovka River. Then we walked along its bank. To everyone's relief, there was a well-travelled path. This allowed us to conclude that it had already been used today by our comrades from other retreating units. But there was not a soul here now. We were all terribly exhausted, but we still had to continue toward town until we reached our destination at Wetsword. This was our destination. It was another good two hours before we saw it, though the thought that we would soon be able to make ourselves comfortable by the stove spurred each of us on. And there we were at last. We came across a sentry who showed me the way to his company's CP, where his commander was. I instructed Lieutenant Augst and Field Feeble Kupal to warm the men in the nearest shelter before doing anything else. It could almost be considered a miracle. We wandered for a whole day, a night, then another day, before by late evening we had covered a distance which, under ordinary circumstances, could have been covered by a day's march. And all this, without being able to warm ourselves, practically without food. And in such conditions we lost only two of our comrades, who died of cold. Together with the company control section I went to the CP, as the sentry had indicated to me. The CP was located halfway up the hill on the eastern side of the gully. Although the dugout where it was located was poorly heated, we felt as if we had suddenly arrived from the Arctic, to a place with a tropical climate. Last days, January 24th, February 1st, 1943, January 24th. 
The company commander, Oberleutnant Jensen, had a crowd huddled together at his disposal, as did I. He and his unit belonged to the 60th Motor EZ Division. They were waiting for us so that this unit could go to another position in the city. Jensen told me that there had been no contact with the enemy in this sector of the city. However, it was expected to happen the next day, January 25th. The Oberleutnant further informed me that these positions had in the past served as summer quarters for rear units and that they would not withstand heavy artillery fire. While we had been fighting our way eastward all summer, these shelters had fulfilled their role as rear fortifications, but now that we were holding our defences to the west and north, they had suddenly become forward positions, being an open area on all sides. To the enemy here, the doors were open from every direction, so that if he chose to attack us during the day, we would be trapped like a mouse trap. If fires were lit during the day, they would also give away our location to the enemy, and that would mean the end of all our hiding places. Oberleutnant Jensen also reported that for two days now he had had no contact with his neighbours on the right, because the soldiers from that section had moved further into the city. In any case, they were a hodgepodge of different branches of the army and a mixture of different uniforms. I asked Jensen to hold off advancing his company until morning, as it was imperative that we all get some sleep. He consented. Soon afterward, we all fell into a deep, almost dead man's sleep. Yan. 25, CEO so 6 DXU, where I am. Oberleutnant Jensen and his company left their positions. It was calm outside. Together with Pavelek, Augst and Kupal, we carefully surveyed our section. On the right flank, we found a small hole where a large shelter had been built. It was not convenient for a defensive battle, as there was no view of the battlefield. Those of our comrades who could not take part in the battle were placed there. They were looked after by the orderly, non-commissioned officer Paul and two of his subordinates. All the other positions were right at the front, some a little higher up the hillside above the valley floor and others lower down, near the creek. Augst and Kupal received their assigned defence sectors. Augst positioned himself to my right and Kupal to my left. I decided that my CP would be located just at the point where the front edge turns south at almost a right angle. However, I would be able to see the entire site from here, which was very important to me. Most of the soldiers in my current company had no combat experience and had only joined us a few days earlier. All of us were in poor physical shape. The few I could fully rely on were 12 or 15 soldiers from our old squad, natives of Silesia and a few Sudeten Germans. I kept them close to me in two shelters that lay to the right and left of my CP. If during the next few hours the Russians appeared, we could not allow ourselves to be seen in daylight, but would only watch them from cover. As darkness fell, however, sentries were stationed all over the area to prevent the enemy from seeping unnoticed into the depths of our positions and to sound the alarm immediately. It was only after this that I put my fire brigade into action. These men were on constant alert, but they were all relieved from guard duty. The soldiers stationed to my right had our only machine gun. The day was frosty and clear. I ordered my subordinates to equip a collapsed position tie centimetres thick and one metre high between the wooden wall and the place where they were resting, and to extend the wall from the inside to the exit. The boards for this we took from the back walls of the dugouts. We endeavoured to dig deeper into the slope behind this position. We used the earth obtained during excavation, fortunately the soil here was sandy, to fill the wall behind the boards with it. The first layer of earth was frozen, but then digging became easier. Thus we created a traverse in the trench, which was to protect us from direct machine gun and rifle fire. Small loopholes allowed the soldiers to fire standing up. We had to conserve our ammunition, so I ordered that we fire only as a last resort. Marek re-established contact with Hauptmann Krauss's headquarters. Nemetz and two other soldiers whom I had sent there with the contents of the dumped container returned with him. A line of communication was extended to my post with the commander of our defence section. The area in front of us was under constant surveillance. 
Two rivulets that drained right in front of my CP, and which, like everything around them, had frozen over, lay only five metres below us. We could fire effectively from our positions at a distance of 200 metres in a direction westward toward the hill behind the gully. To the southwest, along the lowland near Gorodishche, I could see for about 150 metres. Beyond that, the view was blocked by a steep slope. To the south, towards Mokroi Machetka, my view was limited to 200 metres. The day passed and the enemy gave no sign of life. Jan. 26. Early in the morning, while it was still dark, my spies, Hauptfeldfebel Bigger, sent us food. We received 100 grams of breed each, but only for those who were officially part of the first company, which numbered 24 men. Each of them received two cans of Shoka Cola. There was a small piece of round-shaped chocolate weighing 25 grams for six men. The five grams of fat due to each man went into the common pot of the field kitchen, and at last some specks of fat appeared on the surface of the liquid soup. But it was still the same watery soup with ground-up pieces of boiled horse meat. Who was to take care of the supply of the remaining members of my company, those who had joined it during the last few days, I did not know. The only thing I could do for them was to call Hauptmann Krause and ask him to take care of them. I had no idea where Bigger and the field kitchen were located, nor did I know the location of the commander's CP over the units in our section. We were totally dependent for supplies on our comrades who had taken refuge in burrows somewhere in the ruins of the city behind us. The first Russians appeared closer to noon. Dressed in white camouflage, they stood openly at attention and looked around carefully. Then they descended behind the opposite slope. The group consisted of twelve soldiers. We all remained calm. Pavelek, Nemetz and I stood behind the traverse of the trench and watched as they approached us. We were still about 150 metres away from the enemy. Jushko, you take the ones on the front. Nemetz, you take the ones on the right and I'll take the ones on the left. Aim carefully at the centre of the piece. The score must be opened from the first shot. Then aim at those directly behind the previous target. Then cease firing and await further instructions. Try to coordinate your fire as much as possible. Our weapons were kept in good condition. Are you ready? Ready? Fire! Three rifle shots shattered the silence of our hiding place. Three soldiers who had pulled ahead of the others in the group approaching us were hit and ducked into the snow. The others immediately threw themselves to the ground, but they all made good targets on the slope ahead of us. We quickly pulled our bolts. Next! Ready! Fire! Our rifles briefly rippled again, and again we all hit the target. The remnants of the enemy group rushed back behind the hill as quickly as possible. So we were back in contact with the enemy. The enemy now knew that the Germans, as they called us, were holding defences in this area. Henceforth, he would be more cautious, because we had made him realise that we were still on guard. I reported the incident by telephone. The important thing was that we only fired a few single shots, thus not revealing our positions to the enemy. I was sure that the enemy would not keep us waiting long for an answer. A few seconds later we heard the first explosions of mines and shells. They mostly fell either a few hundred metres behind us, as was the case with artillery shells, or a little closer in the case of mortar shells. The Ivans had not yet picked up our positions. That would be bad for us. I looked carefully through my binoculars at the terrain that lay before me. It was very tiring for my eyes to constantly search in the gleaming whiteness for the enemy. Several times I mistakenly thought I had managed to spot something. Soon I shifted my gaze to our position to see if anything had changed, and then I noticed some movement. It was hard to see that figure in the snow because it was also white. This something was moving forward in the snow among the dead soldiers in jerks of a few centimetres. I lowered my binoculars and tried to see it with my naked eye, and lo and behold, I found it again. Without taking my eyes off the target, I grabbed the carbine, took point-blank range, took aim, looked away and looked through the scope again. 
I had to calculate my aiming point before firing. After all, I could only see the face of the enemy soldier in the snow, which stood out as a darker blur. But now it was very easy to hit him. I prepared to fire again standing behind the traverse which had proved its usefulness when we had taken the first enemy out here. It seemed an eternity before I dared to risk a shot. Then I pulled the trigger slowly, and my bullet put an end to the movement of the dark spot ahead. There was no further sign of the enemy until nightfall. I sent sentries to the outer perimeter, who were to raise the alarm immediately if anything suspicious was discovered. Lieutenant Augst reported that on his right there was a gaping hole in the front line, unoccupied by our troops. A fire was lit in the stove, and now there was at least some warmth in the bunker at night. The platoon commanders were instructed by me to conserve wood and burn it only when necessary. Bieger again sent soup and 100 grams of bread per person. This time they sent only one can of shoka cola. We were sent communications men because the line had been damaged by artillery fire. It was just before midnight. It was snowing outside. Suddenly one of the sentries raised the alarm. The Russians are coming! This shout struck us like an electric shock. We grabbed our rifles and put on our helmets. Time ceased to exist for us. Right next to my position there was firing. Hand grenades were exploding. Here and there shrapnel and bullets ricocheted with a screech. The enemy had crossed the stream and was now storming the last slope. My comrades defended themselves desperately. Even the out-of-service men came into position, who also fired at the enemy. Herr Hauptmann, look over there. They're already in our rear. A brief glance back confirmed that Pavelek was not mistaken. Six Russians were running down the slope behind our positions. They still thought no one could see them. The last machine gun with a drum magazine was placed right at the front line and opened fire on the Russians who were bearing down on us. In one rush, I was near the machine gunners, snatched the machine gun from them and called out, Zushko, over here! He understood me at once and he hefted the machine gun on his shoulders, holding it firmly by the bipods, and soon the first aiming line sounded. Rat ta ta ta, and again, rat ta ta ta. The enemies were falling. I saw that one of them was still running, and the rest lay dead. Now we rotated 180 degrees around our axis and hit a line down the slope. Come on, come on. The Ivans were clearly not expecting this. Those who could still run disappeared as suddenly as they had appeared. When I was satisfied that the danger was over, I authorised all the sentries to return to their hiding places. We had eight men wounded and two killed. The wounded were taken to the medical dugout to non-commissioned officer Paul. The two dead were put in a small empty dugout which no one used. Pavelek, Nemetz and two others tried to count how many attackers lay in front of us and in our rear. They were also given the task of bringing here all the arms and ammunition of the enemy soldiers who had been killed. When they returned, Pavelek reported, Eight Russians are lying near the creek. We took their four automatic rifles with ammunition, four rifles and six hand grenades. As for food, they have with them only a few breadcrumbs in their duffel bags and some makorka. Soon Nemetz returned as well. Five dead on the slope above us, about 20-30 metres away. We brought three automatic rifles, two rifles, ammunition and four hand grenades, a couple of breadcrumbs and some tobacco. The guns, ammunition, breadcrumbs and tobacco were divided among the platoons. I made sure everyone got their share. It was more of a symbolic gesture, but I didn't want anyone to be left out. As ordered, my men left the dead Russians in the same position in which they found them. In daylight, the Russians should not be able to extract any information regarding our location. Pavelek told us that one of the enemy soldiers, lying in front of the front line by the stream, was badly wounded. He begged us in Russian for help. Comrade, you have a mother too. Help me. Pavelek gritted his teeth. It's a dirty war. What could I do to help him? We ourselves are finished, and I don't know what to do even with our own wounded. I understood my Jushko very well. 
These men had been sent with the task of finishing us off in battle. Whether they wanted to or not, they had no choice here, nor did we, nor did any other soldier on this earth. A soldier-to-soldier -soldier encounter in close combat in urban neighbourhoods usually ends in death. But when you talk to your perceived adversary, you find that your sense of humanity toward others has not died in you. Human sympathy in your soul for human creatures, pity for them. Anyone would like to help them, but cannot do so because duty to one's own comrades does not allow it. I tried to imagine myself in the place of my opponents. It didn't take much imagination to realise that the bend where my CP stood was at an important mark on the terrain for the defence. The enemy had correctly determined that here was the most important point for the defenders. The seven men he had lost killed in recent days indicated that those defending it had no intention of conceding it without a fight. So at night, with two assault groups, he tried to accomplish what he had failed to do during the day. The first group advancing along the front diverting our attention, while the second infiltrated through the unoccupied area to the right. And this plan almost succeeded, if it had not been for Pavelek, that good fellow, who detected the enemy at the very last moment. When telephony communication was re-established with Hauptmann Krause's headquarters, I reported a surprise night attack and a successful battle in the defence. Jan. 27. The rest of the night passed without incident. The sentries returned to their posts after dawn. The lights were out. There was nothing to suggest that in these unsuitable shelters the German soldiers had organised defensive positions, soldiers who were thinking with heavy hearts about their future, but who were ready to defend themselves to the last. From time to time we took turns at observation posts. The concern that we might be taken by surprise kept me awake for long periods of time. I knew that my subordinates were watching me, so I could not show signs of weakness. My sense of responsibility kept me going and gave me the strength not to fall into despair. I spent most of my time with both sentry observers, looking at the terrain in front of me through binoculars. I counted the dead soldiers who had attacked us. There were fifteen of them and five more lying on the hillside behind us, for a total of twenty bodies. Artillery and mortars again began their concert. Soon, communication by field telephone was again broken. As yesterday, we were now completely on our own. Shortly before noon, we were being targeted by anti-tank guns from Gorodishk. The shots were directed along the defensive line in the lowlands. We did not respond so as not to reveal ourselves. Suddenly the bullets intended for our CP began to hit and get stuck in the travis of the trench. From the side of the Gorodishtcha Gulka soldiers appeared. They tried to shell us. But my soldiers knew yesterday's order to shoot only as a last resort. Three shots from my rifle found their targets and forced the others to turn back. The Russians could only guess where the shots came from. We were in a state of full readiness, constantly scouring the terrain with our eyes. During the day the enemy's artillery fire was intense, but not targeted. So the enemy still didn't know exactly where we were hiding. I did not believe that our hiding place could withstand a direct hit. The best protection from shells was provided by the part of the shelter with a traverse along the front, which we had specially dug out for this purpose. As darkness fell, the sentries went to their positions. From my position it was almost impossible to observe at longer distances because of the snow. We made fire again in our improvised stoves. When the temperature outside stays at about 30 degrees below zero, the shelters cool down quickly during the day. Since we could not come out of them, we soon became very cold ourselves. Nevertheless, these shelters were vital to us, for without them we would have been left completely defenceless and entirely at the mercy of the weather. Without our dugouts we could no longer offer even the slightest resistance to the enemy. Today we had a day of mourning. During the shelling from anti-tank guns at noon, an Oberfreier in the shelter on my right was mortally wounded by shrapnel. He had formerly served in the 8th Company of my old regiment. Pavelek and I came to say goodbye to our brave comrade. The frost had made the body of the dead man stiff as a stone. 
we left him lying by the traverse in the trench. And... 28. I told the soldiers that I would return to them early the next day and stay all day. Then we walked through the remaining shelters, or rather dugouts. We hardly spoke at all. Each realised how serious our situation was. If only I could beg at least enough food for my exhausted comrades. They did their duty without complaint. When we returned to my CP, it turned out that our so-called rations had recently arrived there as well. This time we got a loaf and a half of bread for 23 men, half a carton of shocker cola and warm broth with a few pieces of horse meat floating in it. When food would arrive for more than a hundred other soldiers under my command was still unclear. Apparently the rear services had so far failed to organise the supply of all units. The quantity and quality of food for everyone was the same. In any case, we divided our meagre rations neatly. The soldiers of the platoons that had delivered the food to us left for their homes. I was about to swallow the first spoonful of broth when an Oberifrier appeared in my dugout. I recognised him at once as an old soldier of our former regiment. He looked much worse than most of my soldiers. Herr Hauptmann, I am Oberleutnant Hubner, former orderly of Oberleutnant Bogue. Do you remember me? Yeah, I remember you. What are you doing here? Herr Hauptmann, I haven't eaten anything for five days. How could this happen? I was wounded and went to a hospital in town, but it was hopelessly overcrowded there. I was told to look for my unit and go back there as they had nothing to feed me. I did so and asked everywhere how to get here, but nowhere could they give me anything to eat. Everywhere it was the same story. Sorry, we don't have anything to eat ourselves. And finally today I found my unit here. But we didn't have anything to eat either, Pavelek answered for me. You can't leave me to go hungry. These were the sobs of a man close to madness. I cannot forget that haggard look, that tear-stained face, that despair. I could not swallow my soup in the presence of my comrade. Here, take my soup. We really don't have anything else. You'll stay with us and go to Dittner's platoon. Hubner began to swallow the soup greedily. Oh, my God! Buddy, don't be in such a hurry. There's nothing more till tomorrow night. Try to prolong the pleasure. Pavelek warned our comrade to eat slowly and carefully. On the night of January 28, the enemy left us alone. The headquarters of our section no longer tried to restore the communication line. It was so often taken out of action by enemy shells that it was pointless to try to restore it each time. In this connection, Marek came to me for his daily report. His task now was to maintain communication between Hauptmann Krause's headquarters and myself. The communication from us to Hauptmann Krause's headquarters, as before, was to be provided by Nemetz. Before the outside sentries were called off, I went to the dugout to the right of our CP. Dittner's group was there, consisting of five old-timers from our company and three other soldiers from the former 8th Machine Gun Company, with the last MG-34 machine gun that could only be used as a handgun. All other weapons we had repaired to the best of our ability over the last few days. The weapons captured from the dead Russians were also prepared for combat. In this dugout, the ceiling was much lower than at my CP. The soldiers could not straighten up in it. The traverse along the front was not as high as it was near the CP. So my comrades dug a trench 30-50 centimetres deep right behind it to give themselves better protection from enemy fire. The machine gun was placed so that it could be fired at any moment. As yesterday, the main thing in my activity was surveillance. No one relieved the group of the duty of observation. From time to time I was replaced by Dittner. Our newly arrived Hubner was settled in. He was once again among his fellow Silesians, which made him feel almost at home. We did not have enough winter shoes in the company. It was therefore necessary that at least the sentries who were on night duty should be equipped with such shoes. That is why I wore lace-up boots for several days even though they were two sizes too big for me. Once, when I complained about the condition of my shoes, someone in the platoon said to me, Herr Hauptmann, 
I have some felt lining left over from an optical box. The box was burned a long time ago, but the felt can be used to make two inner insoles. I was now standing with both feet on the felt pad. It was more than comfortable. I put the newly made felt insoles in my shoes, which made them warmer. While keeping watch, I was constantly counting the dead bodies so that I could notice in time if anything changed with them. We had to assume that the enemy might resort to any of the known tricks. The observation post where I was now located provided a somewhat wider view to the left. As yesterday, I could hear the rumble of the enemy's heavy weapons. Today, for a change, our positions were being treated, as if obliquely, with machine gun fire. As always, we did not respond, and only increased our attention in observation. I only fired my rifle twice today. Our number of dead was steadily increasing. We stacked our dead comrades in the front trench in its far corner near the traverse. The small amount of heat that our stoves gave did not reach that far. There they lay, hardened, and their corpses could not be touched by decomposition. When it got dark, I returned to my CP. The food supply deteriorated day by day. The last airfield was lost to us on January 23rd. The few containers of supplies dropped by Luftwaffe planes over the city arrived irregularly, and they were far short of what was needed to provide adequate food. Naturally, this poor state of affairs did not help to boost morale. A sense of helplessness, of uncertainty about what the future would bring, fostered a defiant determination. We wanted to sell our lives as dearly as possible. The comrades who took food to their platoons almost never said anything as they walked away with measly portions. That night, we got a loaf and a half of bread, a box of shocker cola and liquid soup and that was all we were given to satisfy the hunger of twenty-three grown men. After swallowing my small portion, I made an inspection, starting at the post on the left. There Fieldfable Coupal reported to me that everything was in order. After that, I went to the right flank to Lieutenant Augst. He reported to me that some of the soldiers had lice. I was not surprised because we had not been out of our uniforms for a long time. Even cattle are kept in better conditions at home. On the way back, I visited the wounded and seriously ill in the medical dugout. Non-commissioned officer Paul and his two assistants did what they could, but it was still too little. What I saw was a place of severe suffering. There lay thirty of our comrades, some of whom were badly wounded, others gravely ill. The air in the room was filled with the odour of pus, excrement and urine, I tried to find some words to encourage the people here. It was very difficult. Once outside, I took a deep breath of the fresh, almost icy air. If only there was something I could do to help. We were much better. We could still move and fight. Though we were on the verge of exhaustion from malnutrition, these poor men were no better fed than we were. In addition, they had to deal with physical pain, as well as all of our shared mental problems that kept piling up and piling up, we, the fighting men doing our duty, didn't have much time to think. If someone was out of action, they immediately had a lot of time to reflect. All night long there was some lively activity on the enemy's side. We could hear it all as if we were in the midst of our enemies. In the dry, frosty air the noise travelled especially far. Now the Ivans did not even bother to keep their voices down. One could hear even scraps of conversation. We were constantly on the alert and preparing for the end. Yun 29. On the morning of January 29th, our entire section of the front lay before me again. Nothing had happened during the night. Nevertheless, I felt that the end was near. Probably my comrades had the same feeling, but we did not talk about it out loud. We had a task before us, and we had to accomplish it. Marek informed me that during the last night, the enemy had attacked north and south of us with heavy weapons and tanks. Our losses there were very high, but at the cost of superhuman efforts, our last remaining comrades managed to repel the blows. No one talked about surrender. That question did not concern us. Up there, they can decide whether to do this or that, because they bear the full weight of responsibility for what is happening. My eyes were tired from long observation through binoculars. As if wanting to teach myself a lesson, I counted again, 
I don't remember which time, the bodies of the dead enemies around us and on the front in front of us. There were twenty-three of them. One single tank would have been enough to blow apart the frontier we were desperately and hopelessly defending. Instead, our opponents, wasting time, again and again sent infantry against use. They were in no hurry to take their chance. But in the long run, it was unlikely to make a difference. A handful of still fighting soldiers means nothing at this stage of the battle. The once proud and victorious army continued to hold on, but everyone felt that it was already over. The Russians allowed themselves to stall in the same way because nothing happened in my section on January 29th. We did not know how things were in other areas, especially in the southern cauldron, where our commander Paulus was. We did not know whether they continued to hold the defence there. Our rations were cut back again. One loaf of bread and three quarters of a carton of shoka cola was sent for 23 men. Only warm broth continued to be sent in the same quantities because there was still plenty of melted snow. But now we had to make an effort to find specks of fat and bits of horse meat in there. My soldiers did not hold a grudge against me. They went on with their duties without reproach because they saw that I too was doing my best and did not stand out among them. In those last days, camaraderie was not just a word for us. We actually lived it. I think that only someone who has experienced the same or a similar situation can know the true meaning of the words comrade and comradeship. Each person showed his or her own essence, nothing else mattered, neither rank nor common empty phrases nor the slightest benefit, only the unconditional responsibility of a particular person to those around him. Jan. 30. Today, January 30th, the Third Reich celebrates ten years of existence. At the time it was created, I was only 14 years old, and I participated in everything with enthusiasm and sincere faith. At the age of 18, I volunteered for the infantry. I believed in the future of my people and I still firmly believe in it. If our actions and sacrifices helped to prevent that red stream called Bolshevism from reaching Europe and its peoples, then these actions were not in vain. I hope that our people will survive this war. On this memorable day, the enemy decided to put on a special show for us. Everywhere, as far as I could hear from my CP, came the sound of boom. The most diverse calibres were aimed at one target, the northern boiler. And we weren't left out either. They must have seriously hoped to finish off the northern boiler on the day of January 30th. All I had to do was to see if my company suffered any casualties that night in this baptism of fire, to make sure we survived it. It was clear to us that the enemy had decided to lighten his work. After having talked to us, he had left as many dead bodies on the battlefield as seemed sufficient, and yet we still had some ammunition left to play our little game. As for me, I was quite sure that I would save the last bullet for myself, but the time had not yet come for that. Jan. 31 as it turned out, the enemy had failed to achieve their objective yesterday. Marek reported that casualties were high, but where there were still German soldiers, they held their positions and repulsed the attack. He added, Everyone is in a state of real despondency. And we felt about the same. Marek had another piece of news. Our commander was promoted to field marshal. In addition, last night Goering made an address to the German people on the radio and compared our battle at Stalingrad with the battle fought by King Leonidas at Thermopylae. In my opinion, the comparison was tasteless, and I was disappointed in our Reichsmarschall. We fought as long as we could, but were already written off by our higher command. Feber Mir 1 The night passed relatively quietly. As usual for the last few days, I stood at the observation post and surveyed the area as far as I could see. It felt like we'd been standing here forever. The homeland, my wife, my parents and all the other people near and dear to me were so far away and yet so close. We have endured all these endless trials for their sake, and now we have the only choice to embark on our final journey with dignity, just as long as we don't have to wait too long. In desperate situations there is nothing more horrible than waiting. Where can the enemy come from? From the rear? From all sides? Would he decide to starve us to death? 
All these thoughts crossed my mind again and again. Of course, they were stupid thoughts. Soldier, turn off your brain, click your heels. I managed to banish all my bad thoughts from my head. It was easier to bear. Once again darkness fell, and once again nothing happened in our sector. I did not know how much longer my comrades could hold out. How would I manage to divide half a loaf of bread among twenty-three men? And what to do with a piece of chocolate? The broth has become more like a warm drink. Lord, let it all come to an end. As I sat there, immersed in these thoughts, Marek appeared. Herr Hauptmann, I need to take you to Hauptmann Kraus immediately. This position will have to be abandoned. Nemetz, prepare to go with me. Zusko, Lieutenant Augst will take command of the company in my absence. Let's go, Marek. Marek walked straight ahead, up the slope, past my CP. I followed him. Nemetz covered the rear. Our path took us through several high-rises and lowlands towards the ruins on the outskirts of the city. I memorised a few distinctive signs for myself so that I wouldn't get lost on the way back. After about fifteen minutes we came out to Hauptmann Krause's CP. His adjutant, Let Gerlach, was still with him. We shook hands, saying hello. Krause began to speak. Herr Hall, we must withdraw to a new defensive line. The 60th motorised and 24th panzer divisions adjacent to us no longer exist. We must accept the fact that neither on the left nor on the right of the 16th panzer division is covered. You will take command of the remaining men who can still fight. Bring them up to speed. Herr Krause, what about the wounded and sick? Krause looked at me seriously and shrugged. I was shocked. Are you saying that those who can no longer move should be abandoned? That's out of the question. Herr Krauser, I ask you to send Marek immediately. Lieutenant Augst can move out of position with all our men. I'll go back to the front and stay there with the wounded. They trusted me and did their duty to the end. And now, in the last hours of their lives, we must leave them alone with the thought, we have been abandoned, left to our own fate. This is simply impossible for me. Herr Hall, I understand. Goodbye, and God bless you. We shook hands and I walked out of the bunker. Lieutenant Gerlach came out after me. Bert, can I talk to you for just one second? Yes, of course, Walter. Do you think maybe we should try to break through to the southwest? No way, Walter. You heard our conversation with Kraus. I'd be a pig if I abandoned my wounded soldiers. Goodbye, Walter. I had to hurry because it was going to be dawn soon, and I wanted to be in the front line by then. Nemetz followed me. Stay here, Nemetz, and wait for Lieutenant Augst. You'll save yourself a lot of walking. Herr Hauptmann, I'll go with you. As you wish. Halfway back we met Lieutenant Augst with soldiers from the company. I quickly told him the nature of the case. Then, accompanied by Marek, he went on his way. The soldiers went one by one in silence. In the rear were the soldiers of the company command and my remaining veterans, the ones I trusted most. Pavelek noticed that I continued walking in the direction of the old positions. Herr Hauptmann, where are you going? To the front, to stay with the wounded. Can I come with you? Me too. Me too. Whoever wants to can come with me. When we came to a shelter full of wounded, I found that twelve of the men there, including three medics, were still able to fend for themselves. A red flag was placed at the entrance to the dugout to let the enemy know that there were wounded and sick inside. My old positions were only one hundred metres ahead. I set up a sentry to warn us when the Russians showed up. In the infirmary dugout things looked even sadder than on my last visit here. The number of wounded and sick had not changed. There were thirty-nine of them. None of them had any hope left, and they had all said goodbye to life. But no one complained, and there were only groans of pain when someone had to turn around on the hard boardwalks. When I appeared, the eyes of the soldiers stared at me questioningly. Comrades, the company has been evacuated from its positions and withdrawn to the outskirts of the city. We came back to you because we don't want to leave you in trouble. As long as we can still fight, nothing will happen to you. 
we can only hope for the best. You know, back home they look at Stalingrad with concern and sorrow. The hearts of our relatives are with us now. I thank you on behalf of our people. We have done our duty. Everyone was silent. Only a few people were silently crying. I sat down in the corner and waited to see what would happen next. Pavelek gave me two duffel bags with my belongings. Then he took a piece of meat out of his pocket. What's that? Boiled cat leg. I caught a cat in our dugout. I don't know where it came from. It was skinny as hell, but it was better than nothing. There wasn't much meat at all. I tore some off, then passed it on so that my companions could have some too. In my camouflage uniform, I was indistinguishable from my comrades. I still had two egg grenades and a P-08 Parabellum pistol. To it, I had two full magazines and one more cartridge in the barrel. That's 17 rounds. If the Russians wanted to treat my wounded comrades inappropriately, I would have to fight my last battle here. At that time, the Oberzalmeister and Hauptmann Michaelis came into the dugout. In our former division, Michaelis commanded an artillery battery, so we waited until the last day in Stalingrad. <laughs>